Hey everyone, John Reed here from Learn to Stargaze. Now I had a really great question from one of my viewers this weekend. They asked me, so you've done a ton of videos on how to stargaze with a beginner telescope, but you've never showed us what you do when you go stargazing. Well, in this video, we're gonna do just that. This is Learn to Stargaze. So now I need to introduce you to newbie John. Hey, old man. I'm you from just over 10 years ago. How's that career in corporate accounting going? Did you make manager yet? Next question. Okay, noob John, you show me where you're at as a beginner stargazer and I'll show you how I might handle the same situation. Okay, but first, any stock tips from the future? I'm trying to rebalance my portfolio here. I could tell you, but I don't want to create any temporal paradoxes. God. All right, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to attach my camera to the telescope. Now, tell me, how do I take a picture? Listen, noob John, beginner telescopes are for stargazing. If you wanna switch hobbies and become an astrophotographer, that's awesome, but that's not stargazing. You mean if I use a camera, I'm not stargazing? Correct, if you use a camera, you are not stargazing. Now what are you doing? This cool app shows me what I can see in space. Have you seen this? Listen. Experienced stargazers protect their night vision at all costs. That means not looking at any screens, including that phone, while stargazing. Some experienced stargazers avoid screens for the entire day leading up to a night under the stars just to make sure their eyes are relaxed and ready to view the dim things in space. But how will I know what I'm looking at? Well, you would get a copy of 110 Things to See with a Telescope and read it under a dim red flashlight. But unfortunately, you haven't written this book yet. I wrote a book? 15 books, actually. Who knew? A 3X Barlow. So I added a 3X Barlow and a four millimeter eyepiece, but I don't see anything. Looks like you might have too much magnification. I always start with a low powered eyepiece. Most of the time, I never zoom in at all. Objects are much easier to find at lower magnifications, and most of the time, they look better too. Remember, magnification is the focal length of the telescope divided by the focal length of the eyepiece multiplied by any Barlow's. But the box says this telescope has 525 power. Uh, no, despite what it says on the box, that telescope cannot do 525 power. With telescopes, it's resolution that's important, not power or magnification. A telescope's resolution is dependent only on its aperture. That's the diameter of the primary mirror or lens. It's sort of like reading a book. Zooming in is like putting the book really close to your face. The words may appear bigger, but it's not going to improve the story. And I haven't been able to see anything with this finder scope. No kidding, that finder scope is terrible. Now I use a finder only occasionally, and when I do, it's one with a large aperture, like this at 50 millimeters. This finder is large enough to actually resolve the deep sky objects that I'm trying to observe. Most of the time, I'll simply use a Telrad or other bullseye finder. This allows me to line up the telescope exactly as shown in the guidebook. There is a bullseye for every target in 110 things to see with a telescope. I got this sweet filter pack for $50. We've got red, yellow, and blue. What are these for? Why did you buy that? It was $50. It's rare that I'll use a filter. But if I do, it's usually a UHC or ultra high contrast filter. These are used primarily to bring out extra detail in nebula. These are sometimes marketed as light pollution filters, but I haven't found them to be overly effective in the city. Filters screw into the back of the eyepiece like this. Oh, but I still haven't been able to see anything. That's because it's cloudy. If it's cloudy, I'll generally take the night off, have some wine, play some video games with my kids. Hold up, you have kids? Three. Anyway, if you go on an astronomy forum like Cloudy Nights, you'll see people talk about sucker holing. This is generally after you've had a stretch of cloudy nights in a row and you just wanna see some stars. Well, I don't find that particularly fun. Yeah, well, last night it still wasn't cloudy and I still couldn't see any more than just a few bright stars. That's because it was a full moon. A full or nearly full moon will create so much sky glow that all but the brightest stars are visible. I tend to plan my stargazing activities around the moon, favoring nights near the new moon. Astronomy clubs do this too, scheduling star parties on new moon weekends. 
And if the moon is up, you might as well observe it. A beginner might start with 50 things to see on the moon, whereas an experienced stargazer might work towards one of the RASC certificate programs such as Explore the Moon, which is about 100 targets, or a more advanced program like the Isabel Williamson Lunar Observing Program. Okay, old man, I've been following all your advice so far, but I'm still having trouble enjoying the night sky. I have a little experiment. Can you play this guitar? Sure. Wait, this sounds terrible. Now there are beginner telescopes that can provide a lifetime of enjoyment, including providing amazing views of the moon, planets, and deep sky objects. However, some telescopes are marketed as beginner telescopes, but they're just toys. They're just not much good for a broad range of astronomical targets. Take that guitar for example. It has frets, it can be tuned, it looks like a guitar, but when you go and try and play a few beginner chords, what happens? Your telescope is like that guitar. It may look like a beginner telescope, but out of the box, it's really just a toy with very little practical value. Technically, yes, you can see the moon and planets, but it won't be easy and it probably won't be enjoyable. Now take this guitar. It's still a beginner guitar, it's not perfect, but it meets some minimum standard of usability. Okay. It sounds much better. At least the chords still sound like chords, and it could still provide a young person with years of enjoyment, such as some of these other telescopes. Now I'm gonna observe the Virgo cluster from the city. No, you're not. Ah. When I'm going stargazing, I always know ahead of time what targets I'm planning to observe. I'll put sticky notes in my guidebook, and I'll bring a pencil to log my progress. If it's deep sky objects like galaxies, I know that I need a dark moonless night, and I also know that I may have to travel out of town far from city lights. If my plan is to observe planets, well, I can do that from here in the backyard. Planets like Jupiter and Saturn are unaffected by light pollution. Any other questions? You still live in California, right? Uh, no. Next question. So when you go stargazing, what gear do you bring? Ah, the question that everyone wonders but few ask. Basically, you wanna know what telescope I use when I go stargazing. But before I talk about the telescope, I have a few things that make my evenings much more enjoyable. First, a red flashlight headlamp for reading my books and packing up the gear. You have to remember to dress warm, even in the summer, and it also helps to always bring a chair. This is my 12 inch Dubsonian telescope. I absolutely love this scope. I primarily use this with this 20 millimeter eyepiece, the kind with the two inch barrel. I also bring a Barlow in case there's any planets I'd like to observe. Note that these are both two inch eyepieces. And as I said, I always bring a copy of 110 things to see with a telescope and a pencil. It looks expensive. Hey, you asked. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video on what I do when I go stargazing. Please subscribe so you don't miss the next video. If you have any of my books, leave a note in the comments. I'd love to hear from my readers. And remember, the future is looking up. I just, it, sound, like, it sounds better even just picking it up.